at the World Harvest School of Continuous Learning, during this semester, we are studying uh, human illness and divine healing. Uh, not only are we studying it from the Word of God and asking God that we will not just be hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word, but we are also uh, answering the questions that the students ask. They write them out and, uh, and hand them in. And we handle these in a rather, um, I don't like the word unique, but we handle these in an interesting way in that I don't read them before. For example, the questions that we uh, will be dealing with in this time period, I have not read them yet. Now, 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 that, that, now, now, you can make boo-boos, you know, and you can get embarrassed. And I, and I have said things uh, that if I had studied them, I wouldn't have said them so strong, you see. Uh, but <laughs> uh, not lately. <laughs> anyway, uh, these are the questions that you have asked. The first one is, my sister and her husband are both Christians. And they have lost two children to incurable diseases. Uh, my sister was believing God for their healing, but her husband was in a backslidden state. Could his rebellion have canceled out her faith? I wouldn't want to just say it in that way. The husband is the high priest of a family. God established that, that he is the high priest of the family. And uh, he can bring help to a family when no other uh, can. And, but you have to have the unity of the husband and wife to get almost anything. Uh, the, the, the wife can be an unbeliever and the husband finds it difficult to get a thing to function also. But the husband is, a, is, is, is the priest of the family. And, and he has to desire a thing uh, before, before it can be done. Uh, in India, I had a very interesting thing to happen in Calcutta. I was there for a week of meetings. And the first night, we announced them as healing meetings. The first night, uh, a Hindu came, and, and he, he, he had the marks of the Hindu religion on his forehead, and was a very fine-looking uh, Indian man, uh, large of statue and very, very handsome person. And must have been quite well off. You know, he carried himself like a person that was uh, well off financially. But in his arms, he had a child at, that couldn't walk, had never walked. It looked like it was maybe four or five years old, but had never walked any. And uh, the Indian people can touch you so deeply, you know. He, when I would give an altar call for salvation, he would be the first one down and get as close to me as he could. And... And he'd hand out this little helpless child and, and stand there pleading and begging. And uh, I prayed for the sinners and I watched him and he didn't pray. He just kept the child out there, you know. And uh, so when I got through, I leaned over to him and I said, you come back tomorrow night. So I didn't pray for his child. So the next night he was there. Uh, holding this little one in his arms that he loved very dearly, I'm sure. And he couldn't walk and he never walked. And when I gave the altar call for sinners, he rushed up first. He wanted to be in the front. And he got up there and he, he handed out this little child. And uh, I prayed for the sinners. He didn't pray. He just kept the child out there. And I didn't want to hurt him where he wouldn't come back. And, uh, but when I got through praying for everybody, I leaned over and I said, uh, you come back tomorrow night. I don't know how he felt about it. Everybody was getting it tonight but him, except him, you see. And, and uh, so he came back the next night, and when I gave the appeal for lost souls, uh, he rushed down first. And, uh, and, and there he stood. While I prayed for the sinners, uh, he held out this little, this, this little child. And I said, uh, you have heard about Jesus for three nights. Do you wish to be a Christian? He said, yes. I said, put the baby on the floor. So he just, the baby couldn't walk. He just put it on the floor at his feet. And I said, raise your hands. And he raised his hands. And I said, say these words. And I gave him the personal touch. I had prayed with the others together. I gave him the personal touch. Lord, forgive me as a savior. And you know, the spirit of the Lord came. I began to see tears come, come down his, his face. And I said, is Jesus saving you? And he said, yes, yes, he's saving me. 
I said, are you feeling different inside? He says, yes, I'm feeling different inside. I said, then you're supposed to thank him. So raise your hands and thank him now that you're saved, that you belong to him. And as he got through, he said, he spoke beautiful English. He said, where's my son? Where's my son? And they moved, and the little boy was walking all around among the people. He said, Now, if Jesus had healed him the first night, I'd have never seen that Hindu again as long as I lived. He said, well, I, I got all I wanted. And, 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 and he'd have gone back. But by letting him hear and hear and hear until he received Jesus in his heart, I didn't even pray for the child. That while he was praising God, strength came into the legs of that little one and he got up and he began to walk on his own. Was that father ever overwhelmed? We couldn't get out of that building for a long time. He was overwhelmed telling his story and telling how wonderful Jesus is above all the gods in the world, that Jesus was the great one and, and praising and magnifying God. So now that's what the miracles of God ought to do, you know, they should turn our hearts toward God. But any member of your family can keep blessing from coming into that family. They are in a, even your children can be obstructions to the blessing of God in a family. But a father above all the others, he is the head of that house and God will not overrule him, you know? And, and he, when they bring me a young person and I have them very often right here at this, in this classroom, bring me a person, a young person to pray for. I meet it and I say, where's the mom and where's the dad? And then if they say, the dad is not here, I said, where is he? Why isn't he here? If there's a desperate need, where is he at? He should be right here where that desperate need is, you see? And, and oftentimes, I'll say, go get your daddy and come back, and I'll see you. And they, they, they don't understand it. But until you get the daddy involved in this thing, then, then you can't get very far. He is the head of the house. And uh, God can bless some, but God can't do all that he wants to do until the head of the house says, come into my house. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Then you've got a biblical situation. Now, the second question is rather astounding to me. It says, can Satan heal? The greatest deceiver in the world is the devil. I could answer that very easily by saying, according to history, he has no history of healing. You see, Jesus has a history of healing. The devil has no history of healing behind him. And in countries where they serve him the most, purely pagan, they've got more sickness than anybody on the face of this earth. Those that serve the devil the most in complete pagan areas, almost 99% of them are sick all the time. And so he is not a, a regular healer like Jesus is. Now, can he heal? We have some cults who make claims for healings. In the Philippines, we have a cult there that claims that they can do mysterious operations, go inside and bring things out of you and so forth without using a knife. Some have found that they had chicken entrails up their sleeves. At the right place, they also punctured a little thing and blood came running out all over their hands and, and these and they wouldn't let anybody see what was in his hands and, and somebody got the garbage can and found out that it was not from the inside of a human but the inside of a chicken uh, that he had. The, the, the devil is a liar and a deceiver anywhere you put him. And, and uh, he is not a healer. He has no history as a healer. The Bible says that he comes to destroy and that he comes to kill but that Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundantly. And so there's a great contrast there. Jesus is the giver of life and he is the giver of death. And yet there might be in some instances where you would find in a, in a pagan healing ritual, someone say, oh, well, I've been healed. Uh, as to where they would stay well, I, I wouldn't believe it. And as to where they were even sick, I wouldn't know. If they were investigated, you wouldn't find the purity that you find in the healings of the Word of God. And what we love above all is truth. 
We are not going to deal in lies. We're not going to deal in any kind of subterfuge. Uh, brother, either Jesus heals or he doesn't heal. And, and, and we have to stand right there and, and, as I said, willing to die there. That we, we believe in what we teach and that we have now done it for 50 years. And that we're not ashamed of it. And with all the experiences we've had in a hundred nations of the world, we say that Jesus is a great healer. I've seen him heal all kinds of people all over the face of the earth. Your number three question here was, what do you do if you have lost the will to live? You die pretty quick. <laughs> Ask any doctor. Can God restore the will to live? Oh, yes. God can restore. God can restore your will as easily as he can restore your health to your body. Doctors will tell you in the hospital when you lose your will to live that, that, that you're gone. That all the medicine they have can't save you when you lose your will to live. Your will to live comes from God. And, it, and it's very, very easy. I don't like to call it a will to live. I'd like to call it a will to love. That I, I got to love somebody, Lord. Uh, uh, let me get going here. Got to get a little love going over here. There's someone over here that needs something. I've got to go and give them something. And, you, you, you know, you can't kill a guy that's out doing that hardly. He just keeps on living. And so uh, a desire to bless, a desire to preach, a desire to go, a desire, that puts will in you, you know. It takes will to do the moving. But if you are depleted of love, nobody loves me. And if you are depleted of wanting to help anybody, I don't want to help anybody. Well, you've lost, you've, you've lost the, the purpose of living. But Jesus can put a rebirth to a purpose of living within you. And the purpose of living is to be like Jesus. And Jesus went about all the cities and towns, healing their sick, casting out their devils, and bringing joy into the lives of those people. That's real purpose in living. When you see a thing like that's of the devil, why don't you just resist it? God wouldn't give you a, a lost will to live. God wouldn't do that. And, and see, knowing that God wouldn't do it, say, Satan, I resist you, and until the moment I go to heaven, I'm going to enjoy living. I'm going to enjoy living, and I'm, I'm going to enjoy living all the days of my life. You know, I, I'm a peculiar person. I can't ever remember being lonely. Now, I, I, I've sat up in the bowels of ships for 30 days crossing an ocean. But man, I wrote a whole book been selling it ever since. That's not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. Occupied the time. I've been in many places. One of the one of the places I could have been lonely, I was in Alaska at Christmas time. And I had no member of my family anywhere. And I had to go through Christmas. And I was going to go in my room and hide myself. And the Lord spoke to me and said, find the little kid and make him happy. You know, that would make Christmas for you on the 4th of July. And I came out of that room and I found two or three little children. And I told them the story of Christmas and I gave them little gifts and they got tremendously happy. And I wasn't lonely. You are what you want to be in this life. Just want to and put it to work and it does work. Can you say amen? amen? When it says can Satan heal, uh, that's not his regular business. Can God restore the desire to live with your will? Yes, he can. Number four, do you believe that having to wear glasses... Do you believe that having to wear glasses is a human weakness and that God would want everyone to have perfect vision? Now, I've got 20-20 vision. And if you're a doctor, I can, I can prove it. I've got 20-20 vision. I've got the keenest eyes you can imagine. When I was about 40 to 42, they, 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 they changed the telephone book. <laughs> and they, they, they shrunk that thing 
And I couldn't see the numbers. And I said, what's wrong with that telephone company? They, 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 they shrunk those numbers. And I went down to see an eye doctor and I said, did you know that the, the, the telephone book is not like it used to be? Well, he said, yes, it is. Well, I said, it couldn't be. I can't see those numbers. He said, how old are you? I said, 42. He says, you're two years late. I said, why? Well, he said, at, your, at, at 40, you should have been in here to see me. And I says, yes, but I, I believe the Lord. He says, well, why don't you believe the Lord for the wrinkles? Sir? Well, he says, it's the same thing. He said, you don't, you don't have baby skin? And, and said, there's no part of you uh, that's 16 years old when you're 42. And said, your eyes are not sick. They simply need the enlargement. I have no sickness. I have no sickness in my eyes whatsoever. Doctors will tell you. They look at my eyes and they say, perfect health into my eyes. All I need is just the enlargement of that print. That's, that's all I need is enlargement of that print. It's not a sickness at all. Now, it is possible that God could go back and give me 16-year-old eyes. But before he does that, I wouldn't mind if he'd give me 16-year-old <laughs> lines, too, you know. But then that wouldn't be Adam, Adam's race. I wouldn't be Adam's race anymore. Because I am the seed of Adam, I must be born and I must die. And I am slowly dying. You see the wrinkles of death. Yeah. But I don't have to get sick to die. I enjoy a good steak just before I take off for glory. <laughs> number, number five. You made the statement that God has to get the rebellion out of our lives before he can give us our miracle. Why is that true? Well, rebellion is the greatest sin. God says rebellion is, is even worse than witchcraft, the Word of God says, you see. Rebellion is worse than witchcraft. And rebellion is why Satan lost heaven. He wanted to exalt himself above the stars of God and put his throne equal with the Almighty. And he lost heaven by rebellion, not stealing. He didn't steal a piece of the golden street, but because of rebellion. Rebellion is what Adam and Eve did. They rebelled. Rebellion is what King Saul did. He rebelled against knowledge. He knew he shouldn't do certain things. He rebelled. And, and finally he died because of his rebellion. Judas rebelled. He rebelled against what he knew was right. He rebelled against it and sold his master. And so God cannot do hardly anything for a person in a state of rebellion. And, and so because rebellion is, is demonic, is satanic, it doesn't belong to Jesus. It doesn't belong to heaven. And so God has to say, let me heal that so I can get into the, some other needs, into some other needs. And, and there'd be no need of healing a person of a sore on the finger if he didn't heal the blood that caused the sore, you see. So he goes in and does the, the healing on the inside. D did, you, did you realize that doctors will tell you today uh, that, that fear can bring an actual physical disease to you? And did you know that they'll tell you that hate can bring an actual disease to you? That your insides can create situations in your physical being. Therefore, if you have anything like rebellion or these things, they can actually bring these things upon you. And why would God want to heal you when they would be right back? And so the best thing to do is to get rid of those spiritual problems and then he is able to, he can heal you of those spiritual problems, and then he can heal you of your physical problems. But your spirit and your soul are worth more than your body. You know, the, the body can be, can be ill and can be sick and all, and you're still a beautiful Christian. But your soul can't be ill, and you'll be a beautiful Christian. A person in rebellion is not beautiful in any form of the word. And so it's more important to get the, the spiritual man healed, even before we get to the physical man. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I, I believe it that way too. All right, number six. Did Adam get back into God's grace after the fall or, 
or did he die unsaved? Now, I have a way of dealing with problems that I think is, well, I think it's the right way and maybe the divine way. Things that are none of my business, I leave them alone. And, and then you're always right, you know? <laughs> now, it, it's my business if you're sick, you know? But it is not my business what happened to Adam after he fell in sin, you know? And I'll tell you another thing, and, and, and you'll learn a lot of things during these classes from me that, that's real personal. I am not a judge, and I don't judge anybody. Uh, you, you, can, you can let a man commit suicide, and I'm not going to tell you he went to hell. You say, why? Because I don't know. I don't know what happened between him and God in the last two seconds or three seconds or ten seconds. Or, I, I, I don't know. Or if he was completely insane and was not responsible to God. You see, I don't, and I am not a judge, you know. And I'm not one to say, well, because you belong to another church, uh, you, you're not saved. Well, how do I know? The, 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 the problem that, that have been with Christians for a long time is that we, we, we are, we're, make ourselves judges and, and we haven't been appointed yet, you know. Yeah, 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 we, uh, what would you think of a man that went in down in the chambers down here and went up to be a judge and they'd say, sorry, you haven't been appointed yet, you, you get out of that seat. And, and we haven't been appointed and if you say, well, I know he's right and he's wrong, you don't find me doing that. Uh, I, I just don't feel in my insides that I even want to do that. I'll tell you what I believe is truth, and then in the final analysis, I say, no, I'll leave that with God. God is the judge, and I may be wrong. When I get to heaven, he may say, well, well, Esther, you did so many things wrong, I'm still going to let you in here. And I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not believing that I'm perfect or teaching the complete truth. You know, I, I'm, I'm holding it much as I can and I'm reaching for it as much as I can. But I'm like Paul. I'm moving forward into it and I'm growing into it and I'm accepting it as I go. But I still will not judge my brother and my sister. And I think that's the way God would have it. And then things that you can't do anything about, like what happened to Adam afterward. Why would we, why would we want to deal with it, you know? I mean, we don't know. I, I have a feeling in my insides that he cried and prayed. He lived 930 years. I believe he cried and prayed for 930 years. And surely God received him. Now, you see, now that's only speculation, and I have no right to say that. But I feel it within me, the remorse of a man that lost a Garden of Eden. Just like if you lost $50 million, you'd never get over it. You'd, as long as you live, you'd look back and say, man, I lost $50 million, you know. You know? <laughs> yeah, blame it on your wife or whoever, but anyway, you've lost it. It's, it's still lost, you see, that's the problem. But <clears throat> in my insides, I feel that Adam found his way back, and Eve also and that you'll meet them in heaven and live with them forever. I, I, that's my feeling about it. Now, I feel the same about the doctrines of the future. Like if you will say, now, Brother Sumrall, tell me, are you post-tribulation? Uh, are you pre-tribulation? Uh, 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 just where are you? Well, I, I'm a Christian, and I'm going up when he comes. And I'm not going up after he comes, and I'm not going up before he comes. I'm going up when he comes, you see? And so it doesn't much matter when he comes because I'm going up. But I won't quarrel with my brother about it, you see. I won't quarrel with my brother about it. And if he says, I can prove to you we're going up after the tribulation. Well, I, I said, now that, that's all right. I said, don't, don't hold that doctrine too hard because he might come before the tribulation and, and that you are so strong for it, he'll say, well, seeing as you got such faith for it, I'll give it to you. And, you know, so don't have too much faith for it. Uh, at least keep yourself free, you know, to say, now, Lord, if I'm not right, I'll, I'll go when you come. It's a lot better to go when he comes, can you say? But things that I don't know about, I don't like to be dogmatic on. And, and people oftentimes want to get me in a corner and, and have me to say a positive statement uh, when possibly we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't do that at all. Your next question is, uh, have you had occasion to see healing of multiple cirrhosis? Isn't that what my sister was healed of, my sister Leonie? Yeah. Uh, uh, they're in the Philippines right now, but they will be back before this class is over, and I'll have her to give you a testimony of it. Her hands had died and dropped. She couldn't hold a spoon, she couldn't hold a plate, she couldn't hold anything. 
uh, and and uh, and God healed her. And you can still tell she had the disease too, uh, but she she can do anything with her hands. She can wash clothes with them. She can drive a car with them, and she can do anything with her hands. So my own and there's a book about it in the bookstore uh, here if you'd like to pick up one uh, about her healing. And so uh, they they are healed. God can heal anything. There isn't anything God can't heal, and I believe it. What do you say to a person who needs healing with regards to whether or not God might choose not to heal? Well, I don't say anything to them. Uh, I pray for them, and if they're not healed, I said, uh, let's have another round a little later. And, and I'm like Elijah. He only prayed seven times. I'll pray 70 times seven if I can find you. Uh, I don't ever give up. And uh, we feel that there's healing for you. And whatever obstacle is there, uh, that we should move the thing out and, and, and get you healed. God wants you to be healed. And if he's on our side, there's not much losing. And God is on our side. Wouldn't you love to see everybody in the world healed? Amen. They will be when Jesus reigns on the face of this earth. There'll be no sickness of any form and no weakness of any kind. Won't that be a great moment? Amen. 